A quorum being present of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Oversight of Ballistic Missile Defense Part 1, Threats, Realities and Trade-offs, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection so ordered, I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection so ordered. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Burke. I know that uh, you're limiting the opening statements, but I I'm going to have to leave and I would like to say one or two words before well, I you leave. are the ranking member right now, so you're going to be home free with that. Okay. Well, if, and then we'll if always Shays make, gets here, I don't want to. We'll always make an allowance for Mr. Shays as well. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome to all of you. Uh, in a few short weeks, uh, to be specific, on March 23rd, our country will mark the 25th anniversary of President Ronald Reagan's announcement to the nation of his plan to shield our country from Soviet nuclear missiles. A lot has happened over those 25 years. Gone are the days when thousands of missiles from the Soviet Union were immediate threats. Current efforts instead focus on Iran and North Korea. In 2002, President Bush withdrew our country from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and the Missile Defense Agency was created and exempted from normal acquisition, testing, and reporting requirements. This subcommittee wanted to take this opportunity to step back a bit to ask what we've, we've achieved over the last 25 years and over $120 billion in investment. That's a conservative estimate by the Congressional Research Service. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that missile defense spending could double by 2013 to about $19 billion per year. More importantly, we want to find out where we should be going in the future. Specifically, the National Security and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee begins today a robust and concerted investigation into the rationale for missile defense, its cost, benefits, and technical obstacles, and the accountability, transparency, and testing regime of the Missile Defense Agency. We thought it vital to begin this investigation with a thorough examination of the potential threat our country faces from ballistic missiles and how that threat compares to other homeland security and weapons of mass destruction vulnerabilities. That will be primarily our focus here today is uh, just that. Uh, what is the threat? How does it compare to other homeland security and WMD vulnerabilities? After all, a threat assessment, both with respect to ballistic missile threats specifically and comparing this threat across sectors, should be the logical foundation from which sound policy and resource judgments are made. Unfortunately, what we largely have to date is instead a series of intelligence estimates from the 1990s that factually have been tossed around like political footballs, running the gamut uh, from start to start. What we seek to do with this first oversight hearing on missile defense is to have as robust and open a dialogue as possible about the threats we face with top experts who have devoted decades of their lives to exploring these issues. And we're doing so drawing on information already in the public sphere. I think it's vital that as much as possible we have these debates and discussions in public so that the American people can get the most accurate picture possible about what our government is up to, especially when you're talking about a program costing in excess of $10 billion a year. And in the spirit of the robust debate to follow today, I wanted to throw out a few thoughts to get the ball rolling. First, what advice do our panelists have for navigating through the various intelligence estimates on intercontinental ballistic missile threats? And I think we have to understand as we go through this hearing, too, that's what we're talking about, intercontinental ballistic missiles. We're not talking about theater uh, defense systems. We're not talking about short range or medium range. Uh, we're focusing on that intercontinental ballistic missile threat and what has occurred in the real world since these earlier estimates took place. Do we need an updated national intelligence estimate? And if so, how can we achieve one that is free of political pressure and interference? Second, when we're talking about a threat assessment, how important is it to differentiate between short and medium range missiles versus intercontinental missiles? And third, I note with great interest a point that has been repeatedly stressed by our intelligence community over the years. In 2000, for example, Robert Walpole, who was then the CIA's point person on the issue, testified in Congress as follows. In fact, we projected in the coming years U.S. territory is probably more likely to be attacked with weapons of mass destruction from non-missile delivery means, most likely from non-state entities, than by missiles, primarily because non-missile delivery means are less costly, more reliable, and accurate. They can also be used without attribution. A National Intelligence Council report in 2000, entitled Global Trends 2015, reiterated this point, and I quote, other means to deliver weapons of mass destruction against the United States will emerge, some cheaper and more reliable and more accurate than earlier generation ICBMs. The likelihood of an attack by these means is greater than that of a weapon of mass destruction attack with an intercontinental ballistic missile. My question for our panel today is if other methods to strike the United States 
are cheaper, more reliable, more accurate, and provide anonymity instead of ensuring a completely devastating counterstrike by our country, is it likely that our highest priority threat against which we must protect ourselves will come from a country that wanted to cause us harm by focusing their limited resources and expertise on the very difficult process of building, testing, and deploying an intercontinental ballistic missile with a miniaturized weapon of mass destruction as its payload? Fourth, what are the opportunity costs of spending roughly $10 billion a year on missile defense when this amount of funding represents a third of the total budget for the Department of Homeland Security and is roughly equal to the total appropriation for the Department of State? To break it down further, we're annually spending billions more on defense, missile defense than the entire budget for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, 20 more times than for public diplomacy, and 30 more times for the Peace Corps. I have no doubt that the members of this subcommittee and the American people will benefit from the opportunity to learn today from our witnesses and your decades of collective military arms control and national security experience. I want to thank all of you for being with us today. We look forward to your testimony. And now I'll yield to Mr. Burton or Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays, yeah, Mr. Shays doesn't want to sit in the big chair here today. So. Mr. Burton, recognize I, I won't five take uh, five minutes. Uh, I appreciate you giving me a little bit of time. In, in uh, 1983, uh, right after I was elected to the Congress, I was on the floor of the U.S. House, and a fellow named Tom Downey from New York and a fellow from Tennessee named Al Gore were discussing this very issue in 83. And uh, I uh, debated them for about an hour. And that was the first time the term was <coughs> used, Star Wars. First time. Tom Downey, I think, is the one that coined that phrase, and Al Gore jumped all over it. And uh, uh, ever since then, we have been uh, uh, denigrating, if you will, or, or, or saying that uh, a missile de defense system like this simply uh, was not uh, uh, going to be effective and it was going to be too costly. The fact of the matter is, one of the reasons the Soviet Union fell apart and is no longer a major threat was because we did develop and started developing a missile defense system and the Soviet Union simply could not keep up. And uh, they just kept spending their money to such a degree that they finally just had to, had to dissolve the whole system over there. Uh, I believe, especially after what we just saw recently with the point-to-point uh, uh, -point hitting of the incoming satellite that was falling uh, out of the orbit, that uh, the technology is there to do a good job in uh, defending against a intercontinental ballistic missile and maybe even a shorter, uh, shorter uh, length missile. The problem that I have about uh, destroying or doing away with a, a missile system like we have, missile defense system like we have, is that I don't know what China's going to do. We just found out they're going to increase their military budget by a dramatic amount, and they've already stolen a ton of our technology, including the ability to launch missiles into outer s uh, satellites. And, and to launch missiles intercontinentally should they decide to do that. Russia still has that ability. North Korea has been testing missiles that would go uh, beyond the Sea of Japan and maybe even intercontinentally. Uh, Iran is trying to develop everything they can, including nuclear weapons, as well as, uh, I believe, a delivery system that could even hit the United States as well as Western Europe. And so I think that uh, even though this is a costly undertaking, this is something that we should continue to, to, to move on. The, nobody knows how the United States may be attacked. Nobody ever thought we'd be attacked by two airplanes flying into the World Trade Center or the Pentagon, but it happened. And uh, I think that we should do whatever is necessary uh, to make sure that this nation is protected from any kind of an attack, interior, inside the country, or outside. And I think that's why this, this uh, system that we are developing uh, still needs to uh, be pursued. We may uh, find ways to economize. I have no problem with that, uh, Mr. Tierney, but uh, I think it's something that we should continue to uh, work on. Uh, we've been working on it since I got here in 1983, and, uh, and I think it has a lot of merit, and, I, and for that reason, I, I, I will witness, uh, listen with great interest to our witnesses, but I, uh, I certainly hope we won't uh, derail the, the system. I thank you, Mr. Burton. And Mr. Burton, I just uh, I think we shared this with the committee members in our, our brief on that or whatever. This, this first hearing is just to give us an idea of threats and, and sort of prioritize where they are and how our resources are going. We'll have a subsequent hearing on the technological aspects of it. Uh, and, and along the line, that something about the spiral development and block scheduling and whether or not we really have the accountability that we need as an oversight committee 
to determine it. It has been going since 1983 and 120 billion dollars. There's some question I think that we should be looking at is whether we're deploying before we adequately test or whatever, even if you have a system that, and, and that argument goes have one, but how do you go about it and how do you have accountability? And then the last one will have the defense agency in itself to make its presentation so that we get all angles on this thing. Mr. Shays, uh, first, yeah. excuse me, um, Mr. Wells, do you have any comments? In fairness, we've expanded the uh, opening a little bit. No, I don't. Thank you. Mr. Shea is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for scheduling this hearing today. Missile defense is a is vitally important topic. Protecting our homeland is a daunting task. We live every day with the knowledge there are terrorists who seek to harm us in countries that wish to harm us. We acknowledge that individuals in a rogue nation may elect to strike us one day. Evil people and rogue regimes are constantly considering new ways to threaten the United States. We must remain vigilant. Each day we must safeguard our infrastructure and, more importantly, protect our citizens. Sadly, ours is a world where hostility and brutal undemocratic regimes like Iran and North Korea have or seek nuclear weapons. They also want to develop long-range ballistic missiles. Together, these elements pose a dire challenge to our nation. We cannot help be concerned about this threat. Of course, decisions made about how to protect, best to protect our states must be weighed against the various defense options available to us. In fiscal year 2008, Congress appropriated nearly $10 billion for missile defense. This enormous sum clearly deserves oversight. But we must remember as well the financial and emotional cost of a successful missile strike on our territory would cost far more than $10 billion. It is against this alternative that we must examine the missile defense program. Nine years ago, President Clinton dec decried, quote, the growing danger that rogue nations may develop and field long-range missiles capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction against the United States and our allies. Just two weeks ago, the Deputy Director of National Intelligence told the Armed Services Committee, quote, Iran continues to deploy ballistic missiles inherently capable of delivering nuclear weapons. He also said Iran, quote, uh, sought to develop longer-range missiles. The Deputy uh, Director, uh, told uh, members of North Korea, told members North Korea possessed nuclear weapons and, ha quote, has already sold ballistic missiles to several Middle East countries and to Iran. And he observed that one type of North Korean missile, quote, probably was the potential capability to deliver a nuclear weapon sized payload to the continental United States. End of quote. This is a threat we cannot be blind to. Today, I wrestle with whether or not our priorities are correct. Should we be putting money into a ballistic missile shield or should we divert some or all of the funds into other forms of protecting protection for our homeland? There is one final point I would like to make concerning the de uh, development of national uh, missile defense. Before September 11th, the Hart-Rudman Commission argued we needed a Department of Homeland Security with all its accompanying powers. If the Department of Homeland Security had been oper operational before September 11, 2001, it's very likely the terrorists who flew commercial airplanes into the World Trade Center would have been caught. This, of course, would have saved thousands of lives and trillions of dollars. So I can't help but wonder if advocates of a strong missile defense, like the members of the Hart Rudman Commission, are people we should be listening to. It seems to me the answer is yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shays. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce them. Uh, generally. They all have much steeper credentials than I'm going to have the time to uh, record here. Our first witness is Joseph Serencion. This hearing marks the first day Mr. Serencion actually takes office as president of the Plowshares Fund. Congratulations. He was most recently vice president for national security and international policy at the Center for American Progress. He's the author of a recent book, Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons. He teaches at Georgetown University and was some years ago a uh, staffer on the predecessor to this committee as well as on the House Armed Services Committee. Welcome, Mr. Serencion. Baker Spring. Mr. Spring is the F.M. Kirby Research Fellow in National Security at the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Spring <coughs> began studying missile defense issues while researching the SALT II Treaty as an intern in the 1970s. He later served on the staffs of Senators Paula Hawkins and David Kearns. He has also developed tabletop exercises for nuclear war games. Stephen A. Hildreth. 
Mr. Hildreth has been a specialist in missile defense <coughs> and nonproliferation at the Congressional Research Service since 1985. He's a graduate of the National War College, has published several books on security assistance and advanced weapons in developing countries. He has written numerous reports for Congress, primarily dealing with missile defense and missile pro proliferation. Mr. Hildreth led the Congressional Research Service's efforts in support of the Joint Congressional Committee investigating the attacks of 9-11. Dr. Stephen E. Flynn. Dr. Flynn is the Gene J. Kirkpatrick Fellow for National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. He's a retired United States Coast Guard commander. He's the author of the recent book, The Edge of Disaster, Rebuilding a Resilient Nation, and the national bestseller, America the Vulnerable. At the Council on Foreign Relations, Dr. Flynn directs an ongoing private sector working group on homeland security. He was also the director and principal author for the report, America Still Unprepared, Still in Danger, for the task force co-chaired by former Senators Gary Hart and Warren Rudman. Subcommittee wants to thank all of you for being with us today, for your many years of experience and firsthand knowledge on the topics that we'll be discussing, and I'm sure you're going to provide us with excellent starting points and perspective for this series of hearings. We swear in all of our witnesses have testified before the subcommittee, so I'd like to ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. If there's any other person who may be assisting you in your testimony, please ask them to stand as well. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will please reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. <laughs> Gentlemen, your full written statements will be entered on the record, and uh, we've had the opportunity to read them. I can't imagine that uh, too many of them would fit within five-minute uh, <laughs> provision that we have here. Uh, but they were very valuable in the information they provided so that I know that those members that are here probably have already read them or will read them. We'll give you five minutes. Most of you have testified before, so you know the green light gets you started. Yellow light lets you know there's a minute or so to go. The red light means it's over. Uh, we have a practice in this subcommittee of not shutting people off mid-sentence. We'd love to hear you conclude your thought, but uh, being mindful of your other people testifying uh, and their need for time as well as the opportunity members want to have to question uh, we'd like you to stay as close to the five minutes as you possibly can. Uh, Mr. Srencion, would you please start us off with your testimony? Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. It's a pleasure to be here. I have much in common with the members of this committee. I grew up in Connecticut. I was educated at Boston College, and I vacation in Vermont. Uh, <laughs> more, more You've been to Indiana lately. <laughs> I haven't been to Indiana, though. Sorry. <laughs> more importantly, I, I served as on the, uh, the predecessor to this committee, the Government um, Operations Committee, as the Deputy Staff Director for the then the National Security Subcommittee. We did investigations into the ballistic missile threat at that time. We had Steve Hildreth give what I thought was some of the best testimony Congress ever got during those years. I was also on the House Armed Services Committee. My very first assignment when I joined in 1984 was oversight over the Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, at that time, we were not worried about a prototype Iranian missile that might or might not be deployed we were worried about 5,000 Soviet warheads on SS-18 and SS-19 missiles screaming over the pole, hitting the United States, destroying not just our country, but most life on this planet. I have known ballistic missile threats. I have researched ballistic missile threats. Mr. Chairman, this is not a serious ballistic missile threat that we face today. Don't get me wrong. We do have threats. We do have challenges, but they pale in comparison to the challenges we confronted 15 or 20 years ago when President Reagan began what is still the initiative to find an effective defense against these ballistic missiles. I, best, I believe the best way to summarize it is the way I do in the first page of my testimony. The ballistic missile threat today is limited and changing relatively slowly. There's every reason to believe that it can be addressed through measured military preparedness and aggressive diplomacy. The most serious threat the U.S. and their allies face are the short-range missiles confronting us in various theaters of operation, not the long-range missiles that are the focus of the bulk of the anti-ballistic missile budget. Could I have the first slide for my presentation? I want to talk about the ballistic missile budget, which is why we are here today. Uh, the bu ballistic missile budget request this year is four times the size of what President Reagan was requesting when he was trying to find an effective countermeasure to those 5,000 SS-18s and, and 19 missiles. Uh, $12.3 billion sets a record for anti-ballistic missile uh, uh, funding, and it would expend about uh, over $60 billion over the next five years. 
The next slide, please. A, a great deal of that money is devoted to the still hypothetical Iranian missile. The budget requests over the next five years some $10 billion be devoted to countermeasures to the medium-range Shahab-3 ballistic missile. Uh, I believe that in order for Congress to judge whether these sums are necessary, they need a comprehensive assessment of the ballistic missile threat. threat. Congress has never, never gotten this kind of assessment. Here's what I mean. Could I have the next uh, chart, please? When you look at where we were 20 years ago or 10 years ago, what immediately strikes you is that the world we face today has a decreasing number of ballistic missiles. There are fewer ballistic missiles in the world today than there were 15, 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago. There were fewer hostile missiles potentially threatening the United States. There are fewer countries with ballistic missiles potentially threatening the United States. The, there are more countries that have started medium-range ballistic missile programs, but they are uh, poorer and less technologically advanced than the countries that had long-range ballistic missile programs some 20 years ago. Here's, let me just give you a few facts to back up those bars on the chart. Number one, there are currently far fewer intercontinental ballistic missiles and long-range submarine launch ballistic missiles than there were during the Cold War. The total number of long-range ballistic missiles potentially threatening the United States has decreased by 71 percent over the last 20 years. By anybody's standard, that is a decreasing long-range ballistic missile threat. The total number of medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles has decreased by 80 percent. We are now primarily worried about approximately 70 Chinese missiles that could hit regional targets. Some could hit the United States, about 20 of those could hit the United States. About no 90 North Korean no-dungs, again, these are medium range missiles that would threaten South Korea or Japan or U.S. forces in the area and a small number of Iranian Shahab-3 missiles that could hit neighboring countries. Um, all, even with those existing threats, it's an 80 percent reduction in the kinds of threats we faced 20 years ago. Five new countries, India, Pakistan, China, North Korea, and Iran, have developed limited medium-range ballistic missile capabilities since the late 1980s, yet there are still fewer medium-range missiles than there are today. The vast majority of nations with ballistic missiles have only short-range ballistic missiles, but ranges under 1,000 kilometers, basically SCUDs. This is often ignored when officials or experts cite the 30 countries with ballistic missile capability. That's true. There are approximately 28 missiles, uh, countries with ballistic missiles, but of these, 17 have only SCUD-B missiles or similar. Most of these countries are friends or allies of the United States. So when you look at the ballistic missile threat, it really comes down to a handful of countries that are potentially hostile to the United States. And the next chart, please, gives you my overall assessment of this threat. And this, this is the kind of assessment that I believe Congress deserves before it can make a judgment on the budget. It shouldn't be cherry picking. Uh, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be satisfied with assessments that cherry pick one or two threats and then pretend that that is, a, is a, the kind of comprehensive assessment we demand. Overall, a decrease in long-range ballistic missiles, a decrease in intermediate-range ballistic missiles, uh, some increase in medium-range ballistic missiles, primarily from these new programs I mentioned, a declining inventory of short-range ballistic missiles, fewer hostile countries with ballistic missile programs, and the potential damage from ballistic missile attack, while very serious, is orders of magnitude below that what it was 20 years ago. Uh, the assessment I have presented to you is, I'm sure, has errors in it, some mistakes in, in a few of the numbers, but I believe that it is the kind of assessment that Congress should demand the administration present to uh, support a budget request of this magnitude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I very much appreciate the uh, opportunity to testify today on the Ballistic Missile Defense Program. According to a statement by President Bush uh, before the National Defense University last October, there are 27 states that possess ballistic missiles. Uh, that compares to about nine in 1972. The question is not, in my judgment, the overall number uh, of the missiles as to the circumstances by, that, that is presented by the distribution of this. 
By any measure, the United States now finds itself in a multipolar missile world. The key policy question facing the United States now that it finds itself under this circumstance is how it will respond. In my judgment, it basically faces two alternatives. On the one hand, the United States can multilateralize the Cold War policy of purposeful vulnerability established in the bipolar Cold War. Cold War. This was called mutually assured destruction, or MAD for short. Alternative, alternatively, the United States can adopt a policy to defend its people, territory, <laughs> allies, and forward deployed forces against missile attack to the best of its ability. I call this alternative a damage limitation strategy. Analysts at the Heritage Foundation uh, have revealed that multilateralizing mutually assured destruction would be a profoundly destabilizing choice and that the damage limitation strategy is the preferred option for maintaining peace and stability in a multipolar missile world. Obviously, there's been an extensive discussion, um, including today so far, with regard to the emerging missile threats um, in the form of the state actors, specifically uh, Iran and North Korea. Uh, and certainly, we can continue to, to look at that. I think it is important, though, from this policy perspective that we also focus on the friends and allies of the United States that are also moving towards ballistic missile delivery systems and, in some cases, nuclear weapons. These include Egypt, India, Israel, Pakistan, South Korea, and Turkey. How the United States goes about reducing the likelihood that these allied or friendly states will be tempted to use their missile arsenals in a way that will draw the United States into a conflict has not been widely discussed. But this is at the core of the question of strategic stability in a multipolar world. This issue will become much more pressing as these same states may be tempted, perhaps, for example, in response to Iran's nuclear program, uh, to pursue nuclear weapons, insofar as that three of them India, Israel, and Pakistan are at least presumed to be de facto nuclear powers. It is adjusting to this particular circumstance of nuclear and missile multipolarity, and I would extend that actually to other weapons of mass destruction as well, using that delivery system, which I think is really the pressing question and what justifies the $10 billion that we're talking about here. What is it that I would do with the missile defense program to make sure that it keeps on track um, in my judgment, to execute the damage limitation strategy that I've outlined uh, in broad brush here. Um, first, I think it is important for Congress not to put procedural roadblocks in the way of the best technological path to effective missile defense. One of the reasons that, in my judgment, we're behind the curve with regard to addressing the missile threat is the United States had adopted that policy of mutually assured destruction and a treaty that went with it for a 30-year period that effectively blocked in what I would view as the most effective avenues and cost-effective avenues uh, to missile defense. Uh, we're beyond that treaty now. Uh, President Bush has withdrawn the United States from it, but we're still in the process, in my judgment, of catching up uh, over on the 30-year period where, where we were uh, subject to those restraints. I would maintain robust funding for the missile defense program, but that would still be within the 2 or 3 percent of our total defense budgets. I think it's unlikely that it would go much higher than that. I think we should look at space-based options, including the space test bed that is in the President's budget request this year. Um, I think we should set aside the charge that a ballistic missile defense program will, quote, unquote, weaponize space. Um, my judgment is, is the ballistic missiles that fly through space are the ones that are the, are the are the uh, capabilities that have resulted in the weaponization of space. I think we should look at sea-based options more readily uh, than the, than, than the ground-based options in balance. Um, and I think that we should uh, make sure that we don't put any restrictions on putting developmental missile defense systems on operational alert when circumstances uh, uh, suggest that we should do, to do so, as we did in 2006 with a North Korean salvo launch. And I think we should shift responsibility as missile defense programs mature um, from the missile defense agency to the services, um, as we are doing with the Patriot system now, and I think we should start doing with the sea base systems um, in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Mr. Hildreth. Put your microphone on, please, Mr. Hildreth. Just have to press that little button in there. 
Chairman Tierney, thank Mr. You. Shays, um, distinguished members of the committee, subcommittee, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank you all very much for this opportunity to come here today and talk about this issue. Um, I want to acknowledge the collaboration of a couple colleagues at CRS that sit behind me um, in this effort, uh, Mary Beth and the Keaton and uh, Paul Kerr. Uh, their, their assistance, their, their work in this area is, is, uh, is, was significant and I want to acknowledge that here today. Um, there are any number of threats, uh, different kinds of threats to the United States uh, and its national security interests. Uh, what I want to focus on and what I did in my statement was focus on just one part of that and that was ICBMs armed with nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads. I last appeared before the subcommittee in 1992 when Joe was here during its investigation of the Patriot missile defense systems performance during Operation Desert Storm. It's useful to recall that during the 91 war with Iraq, what we saw and what we were told with respect to the Patriot Scud engagements was not necessarily, as it turns out, what actually happened. This underscores the importance of rigorously examin examining assertions concerning weapon systems performance uh, and development. Since the dawn of the rocket age, only five countries have demonstrated the ability to develop, test, and deploy or field ICBMs armed with nuclear weapons. Since the early 1960s, there have been any number of intelligence assessments and studies that predicted that that number would be much higher. Um, the question is, why has that not happened? Why is this not, why is this number not increased as many as predicted? I believe that no small part of the reason, reason lies with the serious technical challenges that countries face in building an operational ICBM. The statement that I have briefly discusses some of these technical and organizational and management challenges that, uh, that nations face in developing such capabilities. The five countries that today have those capabilities all needed to overcome those challenges and in some cases by receiving significant foreign uh, uh, assistance. A review of those challenges can add what I would call perspective to look at all these issues, to look at the, 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 the challenge in developing ICBMs, to put that in perspective um, in, um, uh, in, in trying to better understand the likelihood that countries might develop, deploy, and threaten U.S. national security interests. And I think that this perspective helps lead to a better estimation of those likelihoods. There are many key parts of an ICBM, and in, this, and in my statement I go into those things, things like the propulsion system, the payload or compact nuclear device, the reentry vehicle, and then there are additional factors in, in a, in, in that we've seen in the successful development of an ICBM program, such as testing and uh, uh, organization and management that are all seen as important to, a, 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 to see or, or to, to produce a successful uh, ICBM for, for fielding. I'm not going to go into all those right now because I know that many of you had a chance to see the statement, uh, and I will leave that basically to sum up um, saying that, that it is a daunting challenge. The, the fact that, it, uh, that only five nations have, have ever accomplished this uh, uh, ability, this capability in the past 50 years is, is perhaps testament to the fact that this is te a technically daunting challenge. It's not to say that other countries can't do this, but it is to say in perspective that it is a difficult, uh, difficult task. Each and every one of these things, uh, RVs, propulsion systems, guidance systems, so forth, present a multitude of, of technical challenges and hurdles to overcome that are just not easily done. And that's basically the track record that we've had um, in the, among the five armed, uh, the five ICBM countries. Um, there has been discussion in the past decades since the uh, Rumsfeld uh, Commission that some countries such as Iran, Iraq, and North Korea could develop IC, uh, ICBMs in a significantly different manner. Within those, uh, within those studies, and, and in this extends also to uh, efforts on the part of the intelligence community over the past decade, there are many assumptions made to support this thought. First is that countries will pursue alternative paths to building missiles that will not require, quote, high standards of missile accuracy, reliability, and safety, nor large numbers of missiles. Second, countries will obtain significant foreign assistance in developing those missiles. And third, having or building short-range ballistic missiles, such as SCUDs, provides the means to develop ICBMs. Each and every one of those are arguable. Um, I just want to touch on one, and, and that is that this, this issue of deploying uh, an ICBM without testing uh, is, could be readily done, but even according to the 99 uh, National Intelligence Assessment, uh, that such but doing so would result in significantly reduced confidence in the reliability of that system. Also, foreign assistance, uh, of course, could speed up development of ICBMs and nuclear warheads, but some observers, and I know Joe testified this last summer on that, that most suppliers appear to be 
uh, withholding meaningful assistance. Arguably, gaining foreign help with ICBMs has become more difficult over time. The fact that in recent testimony uh, by the Intelligence Community to Congress before the Senate Armed Services Committee, if you read the prepared statements, there's ver there is nothing in their prepared statements about this kind of assistance for, for foreign uh, missile development, where in previous years it was highlighted. Few countries have successfully developed and deployed operational nuclear arm ICBMs. The developmental record of their efforts indicate how challenging that effort has been. The fact that more nations have not done this, as I mentioned, is perhaps witness in part to the extraordinary technical effort it took. The long history of ICBMs um, demonstrates that such, such success took considerable resources and time, funding, knowledge, infrastructure, organizational, organization, and national commitment. And it's this this aspect of it, this perspective that I think is lacking in so many of the discussions about ICBM threats to, this, to the country today. And on that note, I'd like to end. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hildreth. Uh, Dr. Flynn, your testimony, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like Joe Terencione, I have some linkage to, uh, to yourself and uh, the ranking member here. I Let me get the uh, mic here. I uh, spent the first 18 years of my life growing up in your district and the last 20 plus years living in Mr. Shea's state of Connecticut. But Mr. Burton, I am heading to Indianapolis into this month. I have a chance to talk to the, uh, to the uh, Indianapolis Committee on Foreign Relations and spend a day at the University of Indiana in Bloomingdale. So I'm looking forward to that. Your problem and is that we're now joined by somebody from Kentucky, so you've got to find a way to get there. Yeah, I've got to work all yeah. this in here. Thank <laughs> you so much, all of you, for being here today uh, and the honor to be here today. Uh, I uh, think it's particularly, uh, I, I guess I'm particularly grateful for the fact that you've asked me to offer some perspectives uh, this morning about how this threat sits in the context of uh, other ways in which one could target the U.S. homeland with nuclear weapons. Uh, despite the events of September 11th, Washington continues to look at security challenges confronting the United States as if national security starts and stops at the water's edge. Debates about threats, tactics, and strategies within the traditional national security community have remained remarkably and disturbingly isolated from an assessment of threats, vulnerabilities, and pol policies commonly associated with homeland security. The U.S. national security con community also continues to assign a higher priority to programs designed to confront conventional military threats such as ballistic missiles than unconventional threats such as a weapon of mass destruction smuggled into the United States by a ship train, truck, or even private jet. While terrorists demonstrated on 9-11 that their preferred battle space is in the civil and economic space, the Pentagon has made clear its preference for other entities to be assigned the responsibility for managing that new reality when it falls at or within the U.S. borders. The White House and congressional staff with oversight responsibilities for defense, intelligence, and foreign affairs have also held the Homeland Security mission at arm's length. As a consequence, there is no place within the U.S. government where trade-off issues associated with national security and homeland security are routinely raised or adjudicated. This hearing is very much an exception to that rule, and I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for having it. I cite in my testimony about one of the examples of how this bridge between national security and homeland security can leave Americans less secure by pointing to, for instance, the amount of money we spend on force protection here inside the United States for U.S. military bases. Of a budget uh, last year, about $16.5 billion, that money, about two-thirds, went to protecting U.S. bases on U.S. soil. That amount reflects more than 20 times we're spending protecting critical infrastructure at major cities within the United States. Well, the logic of this is that we essentially are hardening military bases and making civilian assets more attractive, softer targets for our adversary. This clearly isn't the intention, but it's the outcome of not looking at the threat environment, the homeland and national security, in a, in a kind of strategic context. In the same way, I would argue, we have the same disconnect here at the area of ballistic missile defense. The executive and legislative advocacy to build the defenses for nuclear missiles have not included a side-by-side -side consideration of the risk that nuclear or biological weapons might be smuggled into the United States by other means, such as on board a small vessel, within a cargo container, aboard a private aircraft, or carried across U.S. land borders. Nor is the investment in programs whose aim is to mitigate the non-missile threat weighed against the investment associated with developing ballistic missile defense. 
The reason for this is that addressing the smuggling issue is viewed primarily as a homeland security responsibility to be managed by agencies such as the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, Customs and Border Protection, and the Coast Guard. And this translates into having the program reviewers at OMB and the congressional authorization appropriation processes move along separate tracks. In the end, the sum of the combined budgets for funding the domestic and international maritime and port of entry interdiction efforts pursued by Customs and Border Protection, Coast Guard, and the DNDO is about one half the amount that we're allocating for missile defense. Nowhere in the U.S. government has there been or is there now an evaluation of whether that represents an appropriate balance. What seems clear, however, is this. Should missile defense continue to be developed without a parallel commitment in putting in place protective measures to detect and intercept the transport of nuclear weapons by non-missile means, the Department of Defense will end up providing less protection by fueling the development of our adversaries into the non-missile realm. So these two things clearly have to be considered in parallel. I lay out four reasons that essentially I would place the non-missile threat as a higher threat. And I'm happy to go over them in details in a little bit later. But the first is that it represents the only realistic option for our current clear and present adversary, a non-state actor, Al-Qaeda. So that's the folks we're dealing with, non-traditional is their option. The second, that even for a state actor, there's the benefit, as you said in your opening statement, for, for anonymity when you bring it in by a surrogate or you use a terrorist to bring it here. You don't know where the, you don't have the blueprint of where, or the footprint of where the missile came from. Third, there simply is so much opportunity, and this is based on decades of, my two decades of experience being on the front lines and assessing it, for essentially penetrating legitimate conveyances into the United States. And, uh, and, and I go through and talk through, and I'd be happy to talk to later, an example of how, in fact, that system, how open that system still remains despite efforts since 9-11. In, in light of that, I, uh, I, I also highlight here, uh, as a final set of issues here, that when you use a commercial valence for potentially getting the weapon in, you also get a twofer. You not only get the destruction that the nuclear weapon would present, but you also get the cascading economic consequences when we're spooked by those conveyances. And I particularly am concerned about that if it came to us by a box and our response is to essentially shut down all boxes to short this out, will bring our global economy literally to its knees in about two weeks because the intermodal transportation system will grind to a halt. So if our adversaries are thinking in terms of economic disruption, not just loss of life, then we clearly have to think in that kind of totality. Let me, in conclusion, say that I believe there are three bottom line conclusions. First, the emphasis on ballistic missile defense has been received since the post-9-11 era is disproportionate to the more probable risk that other means will be sought by America's current and future adversaries to target the U.S. homeland. Second, the extent that the U.S. government continues to invest in ballistic missile defense, it should be committed to a parallel effort to deal with the non-missile risk, particularly since success at BMD would only elevate the non-missile risk. Finally, Congress needs to take a hard look at the oversight process to manage this duality, the non-missile on the one site and the, then the threat ballistic missile defense. And I think that uh, strikes the very heart of what you're trying to achieve here today by hosting this hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to present this testimony. Thank you, Dr. Flynn. I want to thank all of you for excellent testimony, both what you presented here today orally and what you submitted in writing. I'm going to start the uh, questioning period if we can. We have five minutes, so you'll find that members sometimes get a little testy if you start to go on too long. They don't mean to be rude. They're just trying to get their questions in. If it's all right with the panel, I think we'll try to do more than one cycle through here if we can on that. Let me just ask uh, of the Mr. Serencio, Mr. Spring, and Mr. Hildreth, I, I know where Mr. Flynn stands on this, uh, and limit you, if I can, to agree or disagree to the following statement. Uh, it is more likely that a nuclear weapon is going to be delivered uh, into the United States territory via an unconventional uh, means as opposed to an intercontinental ballistic missile. Agree or disagree, Mr. Cernicione? I completely agree. Mr. Spring? Um, I disagree certainly in the okay. context. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I disagree certainly in the context that if we were to purposely leave ourselves open with regard to the avenue of missile attack. Um, and by the way, I would include in that cruise missile attack. Um, so that I, I think I disagree. Okay. Mr. Hildreth? I don't know. I know that the, uh, the challenge of building an ICBM that would reach the United States is extraordinarily challenging, and I just haven't taken the time to look sort of with Can the same Can you put your rate. microphone on, please, and, and, and repeat that? I the answer is I don't know. I know that uh, building an ICBM capable of delivering something to the United States from a couple of these countries in particular is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily technical uh, accomplishment and, 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 and challenging uh, 
and on, on the other side, I, it's not something I've looked at to, uh, in detail. The same with the same rigor, you know, the capability to deliver something smaller scale into the United States. And although I do know the literature tends to support that it is relatively easier. Thank you, Mr. Rancio. Mr. Spring, uh, in his testimony, seemed to indicate that he thought the uh, ABM treaty uh, was a detriment to mm. our uh, defense on this. So let me ask you whether you think that the ABM was actually successful in any way in the decrease that you've seen in the number of uh, exposures to intercontinental ballistic missiles, or whether you also think it was somehow uh, detrimental to our situation? At, at the time, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty was a, a necessary part of the U.S. effort to limit and then decrease the Soviet missiles that threatened us. So yes, the, the ABM Treaty trade a, a played a very important part in decreasing the ballistic missile threat through the efforts of um, Republican and Democratic presidents. I believe it is a myth that the ABM Treaty in any way inhibited our technological development of effective anti-ballistic missile uh, uh, weapons. The current administration came into office firm fervently believing that, and their number one priority in 2001 was to scuttle the anti-ballistic missile treaty. They believed once that was out of the way that they could advance rapidly toward deploying effective missile defenses, that they scuttled the treaty. It's been seven years. We are no closer to anti-ballistic missile defenses that work now than we were during the Reagan era. Okay. Uh, the last phrase you made, we're no closer to uh, systems that work. Uh, I think we'll probably get into more of that in the next uh, yes. technical hearings that we have on that. But uh, let me ask this question. It, if a country that did somehow get to the IPCBM cap uh, capability, and Mr. Hill has raised some very serious questions about how uh, likely, unlikely that actually is from some of these countries, but if they did, what leads any of us to believe that an Iran or North Korea or something like that would actually take their limited capability and target the United States with the knowledge that the retaliation would be devastating? I believe deterrence is alive and well. I don't believe in the myth of the mad mullahs who are intending on bringing about an apocalypse. I think Iran, as a recent uh, national intelligence estimate uh, indicated in, in last November, that they have a cost-benefit analysis to their, to their decisions and that they would be dissuaded from taking such a suicidal act by the, by the um, certainty of a swift and overwhelmingly uh, de and devastating response from the United States. I believe that there are me military measures we can take to con enhance that deterrent effect on Iran. I believe the administration made a mistake by turning down President Putin's offer to use the radar facility at Azerbaijan and allow the U.S. to deploy uh, short-range uh, anti-ballistic missile weapons on Aegis cruisers and in Turkey. That would have been an, an effective e enhancement to the de already existing uh, deterrent capability. Thank you. Dr. Flynn. I know that when uh, we look at these, there, there are people who say we have hundreds of thousands of potential targets in the United States for unconventional attack on that, but uh, aren't there really a, a defined number of realistic targets that uh, some terror, uh, people, terrorists might want to target the United States that we could identify? Yeah, the, I think it's important to see that there are really two ways when we talk about uh, particularly conveyances coming to the United States. There's two ways to think about this. There are clearly the number of nuclear weapons that may be available to a terrorist are going to be incredibly small. That means they'll be, have to be pretty conservative about how they use those, and they want to get the biggest bang for their buck. And so the things that are most critical for our country are most likely to be targeted. Critical in terms of loss of life potential and disruption for our society. The other component, and is one I worry about the scenario more at the lower end of the threat spectrum, is a dirty bomb in the system bringing something in a container, not because that may be the best way to get here, but because you spook the system. You lead us to overreact, having huge cascading consequences. So it's an economic of mass disruption. A nuclear weapon clearly could be also, when you have one of them, could be used in a way that would be a weapon of mass disruption. And what you're really doing is you're creating uncertainty if there are other such weapons in the system. And when you don't have the means to manage that threat, just like the night we did on 9-11, we shut the system down to sort it out you start having incredible cascading effects. And so it's one part that we have sp scenarios that we target specific things for loss of life and to uh, and take out a regional kind of focus. Other is to go after the systems themselves and create uncertainty and fear that leads to uh, uh, significant economic consequences. But in your expertise, is there a, 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 a finite number of sites that we could focus on that would give us a reasonable comfortability that we are protecting 
uh, those most likely targets? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Th th there are uh, places that either would be because of loss of light potential, a lot of people live there, or because they are incredibly important with no lack of redundancy in other systems that would cause real effect. And we have the potential to put in place uh, systems that would actually provide us with a, a fair modicum of protection? Y yes, uh, to, we have to think broadly about protection. For instance, one way in which you could protect the pipeline uh, coming from Alaska is to have a quick and res rapid re response force to repair any damage done. It wouldn't make much sense for a terrorist to be hanging out in the tundra to take out a piece of the pipeline if you could fix it in 24 hours. The media is allowed, the visuals allow it, there's probably nobody there to capture it, and it would have no real measurable effect if it's fixed quickly. So you don't need to put a National Guardsman up and down the gas line. So it's a combination of thinking some things do need to be hardened, like the White House. You have to think about that. other things where there's redundancy, you can put extra systems, or you react quickly. But the fact is there are, there are a finite number of, t of uh, critical assets in the country, most which today remain largely unprotected in the ways that I just described, and therefore raise a great vulnerability. What would be the budget that you would need, and how much time would it take to, to actually implement a protective system like that? Well, as I highlighted in my testimony, we're just very much out of proportion with what we're willing to invest in the conventional threat scenarios. So I'm going to narrow it down because I'm, I'm, as we're talking, how much money are you talking about and over what period of time to get it fully implemented? But part of the issue is we haven't, I, I can't provide a precise answer, unfortunately, for that because we really haven't completed the threat assessment or, or the site assessments and we haven't thought through with these different controls. But it, it is within the kinds of range of dolls we're talking about here in the missile defense line that would get us significantly ahead of where we are right now to safeguard those critical assets. Thank you. Mr. Burton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, Mr. Flynn, I, uh, I agree with uh, uh, your, your approach. Uh, I think we really need to pay more attention to uh, uh, other forms of attacks here in the United States other than just uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. We had a, a colleague of mine, uh, Kurt Weldon, who uh, was on a television show I had every month uh, bringing in a mock-up of a briefcase nuclear weapon which could destroy eight square blocks and uh, probably kill 100,000 people with radioactive fallout uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I share your concern about that. So I think there probably needs to be a balance and I would be one of those who would uh, work with you or anybody to advocate uh, that uh, we come up with some, come some kind of a balance. I do believe, however, that we do need an intercontinental ballistic missile system and also intermediate and short range. I'd just like to say to my friends at the table there, I'm probably a little older than most of you. When I was a boy, I never There's forget. no probably about that, Dan. There's no probably about <laughs> that. Now, do I get more time for that? No. Uh, when I was a boy, I remember my father was uh, reading the funny papers, we called it, on Sunday morning. And uh, they had Flash Gordon, and he was flying through outer space with a backpack and uh, looking at a television set. And, uh, uh, and I never will forget, he said, that's crazy. You can't shoot pictures through the air without a movie camera. You can't fly without wings, and you certainly can't go into outer space like that. And how are you going to get around with nothing but a backpack, and how are you going to breathe, and all that sort of thing? Well, every one of those things happened. Every one. And in World War I, uh, the president uh, and the leaders of the world after World War I said, hey, the best way to stay out of war is to just destroy our weapons. If everybody doesn't have these weapons, we won't have to worry. And we sunk our ships, and we destroyed our aircraft, and we did all that, and uh, so did our allies. And there was some guy named Adolf Hitler who violated the Treaty of Versailles and took a 100,000-man army that was supposed to be and built a multi-million man army he bought airplane engines from Great Britain, the Rolls-Royce, and built the Luftwaffe. And he was developing a nuclear weapon, the V-2 rocket, and jet planes. And all the rest of the world said, hey, that ain't going to happen. But it did. And 62 million people died. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't think anybody else does either. And I think the technology that we have seen make quantum leaps in my lifetime, and in the last 10 years, even more quantum leaps, would indicate that the delivery system of nuclear weapons could be even become more effective and better with new technology, and that we need to defend ourselves against crazies that might launch them, or people that bring briefcase nukes into the country. We need a multifaceted approach to dealing with, uh, to dealing with uh, uh, the nuclear threat or any other kind of threat like that. And so I don't think we should do away with uh, our, our intercontinental ballistic missile system or uh, defense system. 
uh, because I think it's extremely important. I also think that uh, uh, in, in the process of developing this defense system, that we can also probably perspect it to where we can hit shorter range and intermediate range missiles that might be launched uh, off the shore with the new technology and the ability to instantaneously see what's going on. And I, I'd just like to make one other comment uh, about the mutual assured destruction. I always thought that was crazy. You know, somebody, you say, so nobody, nobody's going to be a madman and, and launch a, a, a war like that. There have been madmen throughout history that have done those crazy things. All you have to do is get in the history books. And if you had some kind of a nutcase that uh, developed a nuclear system under the mutual assured uh, destruction uh, uh, system, uh, they could launch an, an attack that could, uh, could uh, in effect, destroy the whole world and mankind as we know it. So it's my opinion that we need to have a multifaceted approach to deal with these horrific weapons. But that should include, and maybe to a lesser degree, maybe we, as, as my colleague here in the chair feels, that maybe we ought to reevaluate and cut back the amount of money we're spending on a, uh, a, a defense missile system and, and maybe allocate more to uh, what Mr. Flynn's talking about. But I think that this is a very, very dangerous world, and I think we need to do everything we possibly can to protect this country. We're very, we have very porous borders. We're very vulnerable to all kinds of things. And, and, and to do like they did in World War II and say, or after World War I and say, hey, we don't have to develop new weapons. We destroy the old ones. We won't have to worry about a war. And we ended up with a war that killed 62 million people. And just think what it would be like if we had a nuclear war where they did start delivering these ICBMs and there was no defense for it. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sorrentione, uh, you pointed out in your prepared testimony that six countries have had active intermediate or long-range uh, ballistic missile programs 20 years ago, and they've halted them in uh, countries from Argentina to uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, in, what, could you comment on what lessons we learn from their decisions uh, to halt ballistic missile programs, and can these be applied to North Korea and Iran? Sure. Would the staff put up Table 2 on, on there? Uh, it's the, the chart of where we were in 1987, where we were in 2007. Uh, I'm sorry, that's Graph 2. The Table 2 is the, the list of countries with active intermediate range. Um, the, the lessons, I draw on those lessons for my conclusion that we do face threats. Mm -hmm. We do need to have a balanced approach and that includes military measures, that includes research on and, and deployment of effective anti-ballistic missile weapons. But it also includes measured diplomacy, because the history tells us that it's been the diplomacy that has worked to eliminate these threats more so than the deployment of, of anti-ballistic missile systems. So you look at those countries we saw in 1987. These right. were all countries we were worried about. Argentina, Brazil, not because they were opponents of the United States, but they were engaged in missile programs, and Argentina was in cooperation with Libya and South Africa on an intermediate range ballistic missile program. Um, these, these were quite, these were serious efforts, well-funded, a better technological base than, than, than most of the countries who we're worried about now. They were convinced to give them up by changes in their own regime. Argentina and Brazil ended the military hunters and restored civilian rule, and by diplomacy, in, including uh, on the part of the United States, to have conflict resolution between Argentina and Brazil, and export controls that limited the ability of these countries to get the technology they need. Mm -hmm. 1987 is a very significant year. That's when President Reagan started the missile technology control regime, where the countries that make this stuff agree to limit their exports to help re reduce the, the risk that some of these mm -hmm. other countries would get it. South Africa is another, ca another case in point. Similar, a regime change that brought the majority rule and uh, export controls that slowed down the progress in their program had, had much more to do with them ending the program than any deployment of anti-missile systems. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mr. Spring, there it appears to be, obviously, not appears to be, but there is the use of asymmetric uh, warfare. Uh, that's the trump card for the terrorist. And my question uh, to you is your own assessment. Do you consider the ballistic missile threat uh, to be more eminent than uh, the nuclear terrorist threat? In other words, 
uh, when we have to make choices uh, in a world where there's limits on what we can do, uh, how much time and effort we have, how much money we have, uh, should we be focusing first on defending the U.S. from a nuclear armed ballistic missile or defending the U.S. from a nuclear device that's smuggled in uh, and launched or launched at close range? I would certainly hope we'd never face the, the, the that particular question as an either-or choice. That the well, United States would would make a decision that we're so concerned about one avenue of attack that we're going to ignore another or a series of others. Um, what I what I am here to say is is really two things. One is that the Cold War policy of retaliation-based deterrence, I think, is being overwhelmed by the complexities of the multipolar world. And that includes asymmetric warfare capabilities. That includes different delivery means. That includes a different coalition dynamic. Um, that includes a whole host of things that did not go into the underlying analysis of what produced strategic stability during the bipolar uh, years of the Cold War. No, but le uh, le let but me interrupt. I'm sorry. And, and so that, that what I find very interesting here is, is that in the conversation between the chairman and, and Mr. Flynn is, in my judgment, a very clear example of a damage limitation strategy. What they were going back and forth about, admittedly within the terrorist realm, not within the ballistic missile defense realm, is an element of a, of a damage limitation strategy that I think is exactly the path that we should be on. I think that we're getting on the verge of forming a consensus that here. We about that. Be on that we should be on damage. We should be on a damage limitation right, so strategy route. Uh, you know, th there really are choices that you make, obviously budgetary choices, or are you going to have your scientists and engineers and technologists working on plan A or plan B, and they can't be on both necessarily. Uh, and if I understand uh, Dr. Flynn, uh, the, the likelihood of a threat from a terrorist uh, a, a, a use of a nuclear device that's smuggled in, mm -hmm. uh, where there is no return address, uh, is probably a higher threat, on, at least if I understand Dr. Flynn. The threat assessment on that would be higher than there would be a missile launch from Iran or North Korea. And in bottom line, I'm just wondering what your view is. I mean, we don't live in a world where we can make this country guaranteed to be completely safe and never, ever have any possibility of a, of a uh, threat. I don't think that we're going to be able to ever answer that question precisely with, with, with you know, perfect foresight. The fact of the matter is, is that the threat dynamic is, 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 is dynamic enough. But let me, let me put it in, in but retrospect, I, you know, let me put it in retrospect yeah. in this way. Is the United States, on the basis of an assessment that air defenses were not contributing very effectively to its primary Cold War um, adversary, the Soviet Union, effectively dismantled the air defense, air defense system in this country. And as we faced 9-11, as we faced 9-11, we, we came, we succumbed to the fallacy of the lesser excluded case. We didn't have the air defense capabilities to shoot down an airliner that was flying towards the World Trade Center because we dismantled the baby in time. Okay, let me, because let we me, basically let dismantled me that system. Let me interrupt for a second because th this isn't important. I mean, uh, my, my colleague, Mr. Burton, raised the specter of a madman being out there, and that's obviously a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what he's Somebody could do that. Uh, it's not all rational. But on the other hand, we can't defend against every madman everywhere. At least that's my view. Uh, and I would just want to read uh, something that was written in, uh, uh, in the, CIA, the CIA's point person, Mr. Walpole. May I just ask you to try to wrap it up uh, so the other members can ask their questions as well. So if you have one remaining question and a relatively short answer expected. Well. We're going to have another round as well. All right. I, I, uh, I don't want to overstay my welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just hitting pay dirt, you know what I mean? <laughs> Go no. for it, but do it Well, the, here's the question. And this, because mm. I think we're on really in this conflict of, 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 the, of the dilemma that we face. But what Mr. Walpole said was, in fact, we project in the coming years, U.S. territory is probably more likely to be attacked with weapons of mass destruction from non-missile delivery means. And my question is, do you agree with that? And if you do agree with that, wouldn't we then direct our resources towards meeting that threat first? No, I, I, again, I, I think I would agree with it if all things were equal, but they're not all equal. In other words, the question is, is that if you're going to leave yourself relatively vulnerable or completely vulnerable to a particular avenue of attack, then I think it will be exploited. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Lynch, you're recognized for five minutes, more or thank less. You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the ranking member as well. Let me just continue on that, 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 that line of thought. Uh, we do have a situation right now where <clears throat> we, have, we have a group that has, in fact, declared war on the United States. We have Al Qaeda. They, they have demonstrated, uh, they have declared war, they have demonstrated a, an ability to strike within this country. Uh, if you follow the pattern of activity of, of these terrorists, uh, Al Qaeda and affiliates, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, train bombings in Mumbai, London, uh, Madrid. Uh, We've seen, uh, you know, the, the aviation-related uh, uh, attacks uh, on 9-11 and, and some attempts elsewhere uh, out of London and out of uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. Uh, so, so there's, I'm not asking for a crystal ball to, to think about what might happen as much as I'm asking us to, to, to look at what, what is in fact happening right now uh, around the world, you know, in other countries. There's a pattern of conduct here that, that we don't have to guess. Uh, it's, it's happening. And, and all I'm saying, I'm a little surprised, uh, Mr. Spring, that you, you think uh, that, that it's more likely that even though this conduct is happening now, you think that the unconventional threat is, is, is probably less than uh, in, an intercontinental ballistic missile threat. And that, that, that puzzles me because we're, we're trying to, this is a question of uh, resource allocation for many of us and especially for the appropriators. And so we see this stuff happening now with people who have declared war, and yet you think that the threat is greater for people who don't have the technology yet and, and have not declared uh, hostile intent against the United States. And I, I just, I need, to, I need to know how you reach that conclusion. Well, again, I reached the conclusion, as I stated earlier, because I don't think you can say that, 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 that everything is equal in terms of the, the comprehensive assessment of the threat. But I'd also say this as it relates to resource allocation, because you're exactly right about that, is that if you, if you look at the broad array, and let's just limit ourselves to the military capabilities, and certainly Mr. Flynn has made some important points with regard to homeland security, um, and we can readdress this, but just, just look at it. Let's just confine ourselves to the, to the military. If you include what we're doing with regard to the projection of our conventional capabilities, um, as well as what we do with regard to providing for the protection of U.S. assets here at home in the military budgets. You know, you're going well, pretty far afield of what I was talking about. I'm not, but, but, I, but I know where, but, but you're going to you're 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 find you're that that's. my time and you're not really answering the question. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is on resource allocation, we're spending several times what we're spending on missile defense when you look at that broad array of even within the military budget. Let me ask the, the other panelists, and look, I appreciate everybody coming up here. Mr. S Mr. Spring, even though we're, we're at odds here on this one single mm -hmm. point, I appreciate the work you're doing mm -hmm. and, and, and trying to help the committee with its work. Mm -hmm. Let me ask the other panelists, on a question of proportionality, which is one of resource allocation for us, is, is our current uh, approach here, and I, and I just want to talk about the ICBM issue, the inter intercontinental. I'm, talk I'm not talking about medium range that Mr. Mr. Burton was talking about, because I agree with him on that. That's more of a theater uh, issue and, and uh, protecting our troops as well as uh, the situation perhaps in Israel from medium range. I'm talking about the ICBM threat here. Is our, is our allocation of resources, and I, you know, I've got numbers here from GEO, GAO that says uh, we spent about $120 billion on this uh, ICBM defense system. Is that proportional to the threat right now, given everything else we've got going on here, Mr. Sorensen? Let me start. Absolutely not. I believe that the ballistic missile defense program is the longest running scam in the history of the Department of Defense. This is, a, this is an enormous waste of money. And if you leave this decision to the Joint Chiefs, they won't spend anything near what this administration is requesting. In fact, the last time the Joint Chiefs were asked about this, in 1993, the, the JROC, the Joint Requirements uh, Council, headed up by um, Admiral Owens at the time, recommended to then President Clinton that we spend only $3 billion a year on these kinds of programs. And of that, 2.3 should go to theater missile 
defense system. In other words, the weapons we are actually facing that are real threats to our troops and to our allies. This right. program is out of whack, and uh, Mr. Burden, th if you're an advocate of continuing this program, I'm going to tell you this budget is unsustainable. You've Mr. been Hilden? here. Some of the staff may have not have been. When budgets go, don't go up all the time, they do come down, and this budget's heading for a crash. So okay. we should be looking for how to budget Thanks. a program that will have some sustainable technological base. Sorry. No, that's okay. Mr. Chairman, is it okay to have Mr. Hillsworth address? It is. As well? Thank you, sir. You can ask, you may not like it. You can ask, but you may not like the answer. I mean, because, because of the hat I wear, this, I mean, this, this, this is an issue of policy and resource prioritization, and because of where I am at CRS, it's not something that I can really, really address. Um, I mean, I can talk about some of the issues, but, you know, sort of taking that next step, what to do about it, it's not, it's not something that we can really do, so. Thank you. That's fair enough, Mr. Hildreth. We appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Yarmouth, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I also think this has been a very valuable uh, conversation, and I appreciate all the testimony, and I want to just continue the, the line of questioning. $120 billion having been spent on this, uh, on ABM technology, is there any way to assess if you had unlimited funds, if we had unlimited funds, is there any way to project what the program would cost to reach some kind of successful conclusion? S such budget productions have been done in the past. Um, during the Reagan years, there were estimates of a uh, uh, ranging from $1 trillion to $2 trillion to deploy the programs, including the space-based weapons that were then under consideration. The ground-based systems are expensive but still relatively cheap compared to the space-based uh, weapons. This is as close as we've ever con come to an unconstrained budget. And I would say we're no further along in our ability to actually hit a real enemy missile now than we were 20 years ago. Some advances in sensors and guidance systems, but not, not significantly beyond where we were in the 1980s. So we really if, if I might just say that yes, if sir. you achieve that, you will create the incentive for the non-missile realm to be exploited. So that, that's just a key point I want to keep uh, that's in. A, that sounds like a very important point. So as we, w you, you made the comment, um, Mr. Serencioni, that uh, if you left it up to the Joint Chiefs of, of Staff, what is the proper process for coming to the, the most uh, logical decision and cost-effective decision? And, and, and the follow-up question, which I'd like any of you to address, is what do you see as the biggest threats to that process working properly? If it was up to me, the first thing I would do is re restore a budget process that starts with an accurate threat assessment. And I would uh, add to my testimony and Dr. Flynn's recommendations, that you have a comprehensive threat assessment of what the most serious security threats are facing the United States, and then have a budget allocation based on that. Um, I believe that the number one threat is nuclear terrorism, so I'd be devoting significant more, more funds to pr promote uh, preventing that. The second is I would bring the Joint Chiefs into this process. History of these ballistic missile defense programs are that the Joint Chiefs are happy to, to support a President's pet rock as long as the budget continues to expand. But as that budget contracts, they want to spend the money on programs that they really care about, that they that meet their real conventional needs. That's the kind of budget crunch that's about to hit the budget overall and ballistic missile defense in particular. I would devolve all these missile defense programs back into the services budgets. Let them weigh in and see whether they'd rather spend the money on jets, planes, tanks, and replacement for the, the, the equipment that's been chewed up in Iraq, or they want to continue with digging holes in the frozen tundra of Alaska. I, I would just add to that, it would clearly need to be broadened beyond the Joint Chiefs and incorporate the, the issues that are going to fall under the Department of Homeland Security realm because the Customs Service plays an important role on some of these, the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, the Coast Guard, and they're not even at the table with those discussion about resources. And if we look at the overall investment we are making on a conventional military national security apparatus, I, my, my, my key, I guess, recommendation I'm trying to, to advance here, particularly on Congress and its oversight function, is at some point in time a comparative analysis, both on the threat assessment but also on the oversight of these programs. You know, when these programs percolate up to the Pentagon, they go through an OMB reviewer who looks at them against other defense priorities but not against other competing uh, government entities' budgets to deal with a portion of this threat. And that's, that's a structural problem that I argue that Congress needs to get into uh, so that we can start to balance these resources appropriately around 
this range of challenges of which uh, this threat may materialize. And what, and what my second question about what, what are the biggest threats to this process? I mean, I understand if you have a president who thinks that it's politically uh, desirable to demagogue this issue and that that's a, uh, just a, some way that they can achieve political clout. Is that, are there other, I know that's a threat, but are there other threats that you see to having the right type of process? I, I would put fundamentally here to, to what I think has been echoed across here, we haven't got a good threat assessment. We haven't got a good intelligence estimate that looks at the non-missile threat with the missile threat. And the work that I did with the Hart Rubin Commission before 9-11, providing them a briefing, I shared with the, uh, the staff here that the, the actual presentation I gave uh, uh, to them uh, f in 2000. But that work was basically to say, your attention is in the aerospace, your attention is beyond our borders, but there's a whole conduit by which things come to the United States and commercial conveyances across our borders at sea and so forth, where there's virtually no understanding in the defense apparatus about how it works. And you need to draw experts who are outside that realm into this process. So but just uh, one quick follow-up, so, and this is no pun intended, but so we've got a silo, we've had a silo approach to it where we compartmentalize the various threats and we don't consider them all together, is that? Uh, yeah, absolutely, I, this is the first hearing I'm aware of <laughs> that, and it may have been, I've been up here about 20 times since 9-11, uh, but there, there is that where you, you have traditional sort of national security side looking at an element that falls into my arena, which we call homeland security. I usually don't get invited to the National Security and Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. Committee. Mm -hmm. I end up talking about customs and so forth and so forth. Uh -huh. and, and that's a problem because we're not seeing the totality of the threat. Thank you. I, I, I would, Thank I would you. say this too, which is, is that another threat to that is, is I don't think that we've yet fully arrived at a consensus-based strategy for dealing with uh, the post-Cold War world. Thank you. And, and that's one of the reasons why this committee is actually having this hearing, Dr. Flynn, is that we have the uh, unique positioning of being able to cut across different agencies in, in our oversight. So while Homeland Security may have an oversight committee and armed services may have one or whatever, they couldn't necessarily poach into each other's area. We have uh, that jurisdiction that we're able to go across and combine. So I think there's some good work done here by members and by the staff uh, on making sure that we get that perspective. Mr. Van Hollen, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this series of hearings and thank you to all of the members of uh, the panel. We've had a lot of discussion about the, the nature of the threat and the severity of the threat, ballistic missile threat versus non-ballistic uh, missile type uh, threats. Uh, and I, I think it's pretty clear, obviously the difference of some difference of opinion, but, but clearly in this day and age, given the capabilities other countries do have, that the non-ballistic missile threat now uh, is much greater than any kind of uh, ballistic missile threat. And the question is what happens in the future, uh, and as we've all talked about, this is largely a question of resource allocation, uh, because you do have a limited amount of resources. How best are you going to spend the money of the American people on their defense? Uh, and one is assessing the, the nature of the threat, and the other is trying to de determine whether what you're doing to beat that threat is actually going to work. And I know we're going to have other hearings on this, but I do want to just raise this issue now, because we're, we're sort of talking about it in a way that, okay, well, we have these two different threats. What if we had a ballistic missile system that really worked? Uh, and even if it worked, uh, it would probably, our sense is that the threat from these other areas would be, be greater. Let me just uh, note that the, in, in 2003, when Bush administration officials came before the Senate, uh, they said that the interceptors would be capable of shooting down missiles with 90 percent efficiency and that they would be put in place by September 2004. Uh, they made that statement despite the fact that a majority of tests that had been before, performed before that time uh, had failed and that none of the tests that were performed using realistic decoys uh, and the kind of, uh, you know, other systems that you would expect uh, to actually be part of a, an attack uh, were in place. Uh, despite that testing record, the Bush administration essentially said by fiat, not by evidence, but by fiat, we're going to deploy uh, this thing, a very different approach than they've taken to many other uh, systems. Uh, and so once they said deploy it, the Pentagon recognizing that the testing wasn't go, going so well, they didn't, they didn't do additional tests until it was, quote, deployed. Uh, since it's been deployed, uh, you've got a 50 percent test uh, success rate in tests that's done. But again, these are tests that have been dumbed down. They've been dumbed down so that now, yes, you can hit something with a 50% accuracy, 
when you know in advance exactly what's coming and where it's coming from, uh, and there are no decoys uh, involved. So I guess my question to you all is, and it, it gets to you know, whether or not how much, uh, how many resources you should put behind this at this particular point in time until you get a little bit of better sense of whether or not this would actually succeed uh, in defeating uh, an attack of the different scenarios that we're uh, talking about. Uh, Mr. Cerencioni, if you could uh, lead off, and I'd be interested in other uh, Thank you, comments. Congressman. Did I mention, Mr. Chairman, that I live in Maryland? <laughs> no, you didn't, but <laughs> glad you're covering the ground. <laughs> <laughs> He's just Kentucky out. Sorry about in that. In Mr. Van Hollen's district. I, uh, I believe the history of this program has been that the threats have been inflated, the capabilities have been inflated, so it's no wonder that the budgets have been inflated. I believe $12.3 billion, which is what the request is for this year, is, is completely out of proportion to both the threats we face and the capabilities we currently have. You've got to restore some realism to the program. I'm not saying we cut it out, but you bring it back down to reality. You do an accurate threat assessment and you restore operational testing common sense to the program. You, you don't buy it before you fly it. We have never in the history of the last 20 years had a realistic test of any of these systems, the kind you describe, that has flown up against what we had actually expect even a primitive country to deploy like North Korea or Iran. The, the, the NIE indicates that any country that can fly an ICBM is going to be capable of deploying a, a, one of or perhaps all of six basic countermeasures, including chaff, balloons, other uh, countermeasures that can defeat the system. We've never had a test of these weapons. And until we do, how can the Congress possibly justify sticking these things in holes in Alaska or straining our alliance to try to convince Poland or the Czech Republic to deploy it? Fly before you buy accurate threat assessments. That would be the rule of thumb. And then shift some of the money out of missile defense to the number one priority that we have, which is making sure that the next 9-11 attack is a non-nuclear 9-11. Let's prevent nuclear terrorism, the number one threat facing the United States today. I'm afraid that what you've described there is what I would call a cycle of failure. That is, is that if what we do um, is say, um, we're going to reduce money for the testing until we can prove that the system will work, is that basically then you're defunding the testing that as you acknowledge would need to go forward to make sure the system works. Um, so that uh, uh, I think that we actually, if you want to improve technological pro pro progress, then you're gonna have to make the investments in order to achieve that. But I let, me, let me speak also just very briefly about fly before you buy. This is a system of systems approach that we're doing in missile defense. It means, because of the nature of the system, you have to build it in order to test it. We didn't do full constellation end-to-end -end testing of the Global Positioning System satellite network. We started putting satellites in place in pieces, building it, feeling it, testing it concurrently. That's not the answer, admittedly, in all defense programs. But in systems of systems approaches, it is an unavoidable requirement. The, the only thing, it's almost uh, surreal for me coming from the other end of the spectrum. Whatever you just whack away, if you have scraps, I'll take them for the non-missile threat. <laughs> if I could <laughs> just point out, uh, if there's way to the slides, if I could just share with you this here, this is just a few pictures of the world that I operated I you know, in. And just to give an idea, uh, this is the longer one uh, that, that's here. This is what I actually just give you the scenario of the environment that, that I work through. Can we, uh, can we go on to the next? I'm not sure how that one comes through. Okay, so skip through. Uh, next one. Are we moving? Next. Okay, back up. To, uh, back up. To, to we got to start with the picture. Uh, basically, I, I gave this uh, these slides uh, two uh, <laughs> two more times. We got to get the picture here. Uh, the, the, here, I saw. This is what I gave to the hot river. So we have this guy, Obama. He uh, 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 named uh, Osama bin Laden, who uh, did this to our embassy. Move on to the next one. I said my scenario would be. Next slide, please. Uh, coming out of Port of Karachi, we have a cut and sew shops there where you basically stuff containers with day labor. That container ends up next in uh, uh, situations like these, local coastal barges that loaded onto these inter-Asia ships that carry about 300 barges. They'll go to a port like Hong Kong next. 
in a place like this that moved five and a half million containers last year, next, on a ship like this that carries about 5,000, 6,000, there are up to 10,000 to use, next, land in a place like Long Beach, uh, move, next one, move on rail, next, into a places like switch stations in Chicago, next, where you have boxes like this, next, or the port in New York, New Jersey, next, which is directly adjacent to a place like Newark International Airport, where New Jersey Turnpike runs directly adjacent to, which is also where a pipeline is at its, uh, at its head for New England, basically the throat for, for New England, as this, uh, uh, this chart illustrates. Okay? And, and what I was basically making the case of here is that there is a world out there where you can have access to conveyances that really is about access to a truck driver who gives you a hold of a container, and that's how containers get to the United States and end up in Walmart and one of shells. And that's the world that I operate in. And the amount of resources we've dedicated to that problem is minuscule compared to the kind of resources we've obviously invested in dealing with ballistic missile threat. That, that, that's the kind of disconnect we're operating right and, now. And we'll all sleep well for that. Thank you. Uh, the question is, do you sleep at night? Uh, Mr. Burton, you'd like to enter something onto the record and uh, ask some questions? Y yes, Recognize Mr. Chairman. five minutes. I'll try to be more brief than that because we have boats coming up here in just a few minutes. Uh, I am going to enter this into the record and I ask that we do this uh, tonight. Without here. objection, so ordered. It says the uh, uh, missile, the ballistic missile defense system and the missile defense agency conducted 10 hit to kill intercepts in 2007, including six intercepts of the Aegis. Aegis uh, BMD element, three intercepts of the terminal high altitude area defense element, and an end-to-end -end intercept of a long-range target by the ground-based mid-course defense system in California. In addition to these flights in 2007, they conducted successful tests of the sea-based X-band radar command, control battle management and communications system, and other sensors, radars over multiple time zones, and since 2001, there have been 34 of 42 terminal and mid-course hit-to-kill intercepts in atmosphere and space. Those aren't hypotheticals. They actually did that. And, uh, and I understand since uh, in just the last year or so, there's been even more successes. I agree, as I said before, with what you said. I, I think we're really vulnerable at our seaports and in our cities, and our borders are very porous. And I think we ought to have a more complete threat assessment, Mr. Chairman where we find out really what, we're, what we should be doing that we're not doing right now to make sure that the homeland is secure for some internal operation or something at our seaports. At the same time, though, and I know how vehemently you feel about this. I mean, you, you, you come across pretty strong. I still think that we need a very strong anti-missile, ballistic missile system, and uh, it should be uh, uh, effective in, in, in all three areas, intercontinental, short-term and, and medium and uh, intermediate uh, uh, distance missiles. So with that, Mr. Chairman, since we're short on time, I will just submit this for the record and thank you gentlemen very, very much. We're going to be having both some minutes, so I won't be with you, but thanks for your testimony. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Mr. Burton. And uh, Mr. Burton, I say we're going to enter this on today's record. I have no problem with that. You may want to uh, bring it back, have Mr. Shays bring it back for the next hearing where we'll be talking about capabilities and things as well. Okay. Look, it's on both records for that, if that's the point that I'll you want to make, and, and I appreciate Mr. that. I'll have Mr. Shays bring me back, too. Okay. Uh, I just want to make a statement on that. I, I understand that that statement uh, made those points, uh, but I caution all of us to recognize what is the success and how it's defined. Uh, my experience with this thing over a dozen years or so has been that the uh, agency tends to define success uh, of a rather animated uh, process where they uh, simulate tests and then call it a success, where they use uh, compartments or aspects of that program that are not the final operational aspect at all, but rather a prototype, which is not, is not the one they're finally going to use, where the target is identified in advance. And there are a lot of issues around what they call a success and what is actually hit to kill. But when we get into that next week, I think those are legitimate questions to ask, and we should really define what's been successful and what hasn't, whether or not there's been realistic and operational testing on that. And whether or not, as the Congressional Budget Office suggests, we, that we ought not to go back to an evolutionary process where we actually test before we build. Uh, I mean, this is uh, part of the crux of the thing. The whole uh, DTO and E office was designed to stop the Defense Department from running amok as they had with so many systems of building, only to find out that it didn't work, 
And then we lost not only the money, but the time. So even for those who believe this is a system worth pursuing, you would think that they would have some feeling for the idea of pursuing it in a logical sense uh, that is economical so that we can take care of all of our risks uh, at the same time, not be exclusive, uh, but focus on the testing so that we don't lose time and money uh, going down the path of actually building, deploying before they're ready to work. But you know, we talk about our own system, and that's going to be for the next hearing, but you know, Mr. Hildreth, I want to talk to you a little bit about our tendency to overestimate the capacity uh, of others, particularly Iran and North Korea. Uh, from my understanding, and, and I have a, a window through the Intelligence uh, Committee as well as uh, this committee's work uh, and general open source knowledge on that, uh, they still have issues about their propulsion systems. Am I right? Yes. And they still have serious yes. issues about their guidance systems. You can raise te you can raise questions about every single one of those elements of an ICBM. Yes. And neither one of them has perfected the way of compacting a payload in order to put it on a missile head so they can be sent somewhere. Isn't that correct? That's correct. All right. And neither one of them has perfected the reentry vehicle issues and challenges that are out there. To my knowledge, they haven't tested that um, outside the laboratory. If they've done it inside the laboratory at all. Okay. And you write in your, in your testimony something I think is very important, the need for a full system testing. Just as we've never had that with our defensive operation with that, neither of these countries even come remotely close to fully testing a start to finish system, correct? I would argue so, yes. Yeah. And it, that's an enormous undertaking. Will you tell us a little bit about what that entails? Most of that discussion is, is touched on in, in the statement, and, and but basically you've got an ICBM is a, is, is, is a complex uh, set of technologies that need to be integrated together. Each one of those, those elements, those main elements themselves, constitute a whole range of, of technical challenges that must be overcome. They need to be tested independently and proven to be successful. Uh, a lot of that stuff can be done internally um, uh, inside labs. Um, some of it can be done, uh, in a lot of it could probably, uh, much of it could probably be done in ways that could be masked or hidden. Uh, but in the end, uh, even those major subsystems like reentry vehicles or propulsion systems, is, it's not something you can, you can buy a computer model for and say, you know, these, this is what we're doing and plug the numbers in and it shows that we're going to have success. You have to go out and, and test these things in a way that are, for, by, large, by large measure, uh, observable. Uh, you can't hide these things very well, especially the testing of RVs. I mean, there's no, th you just can't gain the kind of experience you need to understand the dynamics that an RV will experience inside a laboratory. They don't make wind tunnels that can blow, you know, that, 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 you can, that, that, that mimic the same kind of stress as that an, a reentry vehicle will experience when it's coming in at several velocities a se you know, per second and, uh, and, and many tens of, uh, of uh, well, and massive forces uh, for, de for decelerate and massive deceleration. You can't you can't do that inside a lab. The only way you can do it is to actually go out and do it. Uh, and those things can't be hidden. You can't hide the fact that people will test a missile and you might be able to shoot something up under the guise of a space launch vehicle, for example, and show that you have developed the capacity to develop, to, 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 to boost, to, sh to shoot a missile uh, and, and launch something into orbit. But it's a totally different, it's a totally separate challenge and problem to have something re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and survive re-entry. It's not an easy thing. And you can't get around that by not testing. And so uh, you, these are just things you don't see these other countries doing. You make the point in your, in your written testimony that some of the long-range ballistic missiles that we use to test intercept targets for our own ballistic missile defense program have failed to launch or to operate in order to allow the test to proceed. And that's with 50 years of considerable United States long-range experience which none of these, neither Iran or North Korea, for that matter, any of the other countries uh, have on that. And I think that's an excellent point. The other aspect that we, I don't have time to question you on or anything is the whole idea of management and organization uh, of, you know, some 80,000 people sometimes involved in a program as it evolves on that, that uh, and all the necessary coordination uh, to overcome these challenges that doesn't exist. The bottom line of my point on this uh, being that if we're, uh, you know, if we're serious about this, we have the time to do this right. If those that believe that we can have an effective ballistic missile uh, intercept or whatever, we have the time to do it right to test and then build as we get things that are accomplished or whatever. That way, if it doesn't work, we don't have to spend all that money in that direction. But as it does work, we might have the confidence to move to the next system on that. Testing, 
reliability and confidence is reliable are as important to our defense system as it is to them when they think of whether or not they're going to use something offensive against us. If we go back and take the CBO's recommendation on that, it gives us the opportunity to allocate resources to testing and allocate resources to making this country confident, again, that we're doing everything that we can do and relying on our resilience because we know that if something goes outside, we'll have done all we can do, but we're a resilient nation, as Mr. Dr. Flynn has said in his written comments, and we can move on from there. Mr. Welch, you have no further questions, I understand. The same with Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Van Hollen, do you have any further questions? Gentlemen, would any of you like to make a final remark? Is there something that we left unsaid that you'd like to address? Just on your last point, sir, the one of the justifications that Secretary Rumsfeld gave for exempting the anti-ballistic missile programs from the normal operational testing process was the urgency of the threat. Uh, I believe that the threat is not urgent, that it is limited and developing ra rather slowly. So the two are related, the, the, the inaccurate threat assessment and, and thorough and realistic operational testing. If you get one right, it helps you uh, get the other right as well. Thank you. Any other person on the I panel? Like to just, say just the last point to say that the non-missile threat, I firmly believe in my analysis, is the higher probability threat, and it also is a vast distance behind what we've been trying to develop in the ballistic missile defense. So we need to be thinking about whatever we do in this area done in concert with the non-missile. So just to reinforce that final point. Thank you. Mr. Spring, would you like to? Uh, uh, I just say is that I'd, I'd like to urge the committee to focus on the requirements of the damage limitation strategy and say why not missile defense among the other requirements for, for protecting the, the American people, our friends and allies and forces afield. I want to thank all of you. Uh, Mr. Hildreth, the work the CRS does is uh, in not just this area, uh, but in many areas, very helpful to us. It's a great resource, and we use it on a, a number of different committees. Uh, all the other witnesses, thank you for your expertise, your frankness with us, and uh, the way that you approach this is, is, is very, very helpful. Mr. Burton, thank you. I thought you brought a great perspective to it, and we look forward to working with you. Other members of the committee, thank you for your input. Thank the staff for their work as well. I think you got us off to a good start on a very serious issue. Uh, it's enormously expensive and, and very, very important to our defense. Uh, with that, this uh, hearing is closed. Thank you.